The Chris Johnston Show. Let's go! Your number one destination for a behind-the-scenes look at the game of hockey. Is this thing on? Here's NHL insider Chris Johnston and host Julian McKenzie. Big Money Siege. Uh, let's look into the Canadians-Leafs game to start off uh, our Thursday edition of our show. You, you mentioned just before we got on today, all these other games had all these wild, crazy scores. And then Montreal-Toronto, a one nothing game. <laughs> it's just kind of funny to see that scoreline, considering the craziness of uh, Wednesday night. Yeah, one nothing you associate with games in May and June, not not games that are played in October, right? I mean, this is this is the this is the time for if you're Miko Rantanen to get your hat tricks in when when you know teams aren't in sync yet, maybe goaltenders are still getting back up to speed. So which he you did. don't expect exactly. You don't expect one nothing. Um, but you also don't expect a 48 save shutout for Samuel Montembeau. Um, you know, pretty, pretty nice start to the year for him and what I think is an important season. And, and, you know, got, had a little help from his, his goalposts, but, you know, as goalies have said, you got to stop the ones that are going in. And he, he did that. And, um, yeah, interesting start to the year. I mean, it's amazing. We go through weeks and weeks and weeks of discussing storylines, like breaking down teams, and then a game gets played, and it just feels like everything spins in in other directions. And and you know, obviously, some hope in Montreal that team is going to be more competitive than they've been the last three years when they've been a bottom five team league wide. And um, you know, pretty pretty good first foot forward. Nice to see Cole Caulfield score a goal honoring Johnny Goodrow with the, mm-hmm. the number thirteen sweater on his back. And I um, you know, just up. love the love the Bell Center. Anyone who's a loyal listener will know that uh, I have much affection for games in that that building, as I, I know you do as well. So, you know, pretty pretty nice opening night there in uh, La Belle Provence. Uh, the best atmosphere in the league. I mean, I haven't been to every single rink, and Vegas very much surprised me. But I haven't found a rink with a better atmosphere than the Bell Center. Uh, with Cole Caulfield, uh, he did score the one goal in that game. I thought it was. I was, it was just, it was fitting. I, I liked it. Uh, the, the, he did uh, switch his number from 22 to 13, uh, this offseason in honor of, of Johnny Goodrow. That was, it, it was a, it was a very touching moment, I thought. Yeah. It looked like he pointed upwards and skywards a little bit there. And, and, you know, whether he did or not, just, you know, obviously he's, he's doing that in, in honor of a player that he described as his idol, someone who became a friend and a, a teammate. They played together at the World Hockey Championship in May. And so, you know, just, I'm I'm a sucker for for I mean it just seemed nice that it's only fitting kind of that he would score the first goal of the year and you know one one point I didn't make on Montembeau Julian and and mm-hmm. I tweeted this and I was surprised at the number of people who yes. pushed back on I me. wanted to get in on this because I saw this and I don't think it was the first time you've you've made mention of that and I, I think we should get into this. Well, okay, we're going to talk about Canada's goaltending as we move into these best on best events, right? The next one up is yes. the Four Nations face off in February. The team has to be picked by December 2nd. So, doing some quick math here, that's 53 days. Uh, it's not really that far away, right? A little bit more than 7 weeks. Um mm-hmm. it, team Canada is going to have to put in its roster and you know, who is going to be the goaltender? I I think Samuel Montembeau has a fantastic chance to be among the 3. Canadian goalies, I'm not saying at this point he's going to be the starter. I think, quite frankly, the Canadian management's in a position where they have to go with whoever's playing the best at that point in time uh, in, in their estimation. Um, but, you know, people seem to think I'm crazy for suggesting it. Where I, I, I didn't want to argue with the internet because you can't win, but I wanted to be like, okay, so if Montebo isn't in the top three, who are the three that are 100% better than him? I mean, among the players you consider, Jordan Bennington, Stuart Skinner, uh, maybe Connor Ingram uh, playing in Utah. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we just, we're not in the era, and, and I'm sure there are others, but my point is we're not in the era. Aiden Hill won a cup in Vegas uh, a couple of years ago. We're not in the era where it's like automatically you have a Marty Prodeur to throw in there or, or Roberto Luongo or Carey Price. I mean, Canada, I'm sure lots of people paid attention to this as, as slipped as a goaltending country. And so Montembo. You know, I think that start of this season, I don't know how much of a priority it is for him, but it's, I mean, certainly has a great opportunity here to be playing games at the Bell Center in February when the entire NHL's off wearing the Maple Leaf. Um, and so I just, the, the thought crossed my mind when he was having such a, a good start to the season that, you know, that, that's a positive for him. And then I feel like I had a lot of people yelling at me saying, 
he's not in the mix. I can tell you he is in the mix and, and, you know, what happens in the nev- next seven weeks will ultimately decide who the three goalies are. Sam Montembeau won a gold medal with Canada at the World Championship. Uh, you would know better than me, but guys who play for Team Canada at the World Championships, like Talkie Canada remembers that, and, and they keep that in mind when they build teams going forward. Like This is not just a, a pick out of nowhere where you're just going off of one 48 safe performance. Like Sam Montembeau is slowly building up a resume. He's building up a case to, to, to be on that team. Sure. And, you know, he's got excellent goals saved above expected numbers. He had a really strong season last year. It's just, you know, gets lost a little bit, right? Montreal, his team has not played any meaningful games in a long time. Uh, he's not a household name. I mean, the Canadians got him by claiming him off waivers. So, uh, you know, it's not as though he, he doesn't have the pedigree again of, you know, Carey Price was a fifth overall pick, right? Patrick Waugh is winning cups like in his first year or two in the league. I mean, he, he doesn't have that level of pedigree or hype around him, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a reflection of two things. It's where the state of the overall Canadian goaltending's at is that there isn't the alpha dog, you know, obvious picks. And he's going to, yeah, I think he's got a great chance to get there anyway. So I just wanted to touch on that since I have the microphone on this show because I didn't want to use, I didn't want to get battling everyone on Twitter. And, you know, it's not like a hill I'm going to die on here. I'm just telling you as a fact, he's, he's certainly in the, in the mix. Well, at some point, we are going to, you know, do something involving the four nations face off in terms of a, you know, pick your Team Canada roster. And I'm very intrigued to know if, let's say, we do this in, I don't know, well, the date you mentioned for when the lineup has well, to be. Well, if I'm doing it today, Montembeau is one of my three. So there's, there, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give you a spoiler. I want to know if in December, <laughs> I want to know if in December, if we do this, he's still on that list. I would think he is. I, I think you're absolutely right to, to consider him as someone who has a chance to make the team, especially considering what goaltending looks like. Note, he's not saying, CJ's not saying Sam Montembeau is the absolute number one goaltender for Team Canada. He's just saying he has a chance at making that team. And I don't think he's wrong. Well, let's let's hope he gets some better defense played in front of him in the games ahead yeah. because, you know, well, it is a nice story on night one that he made 48 saves. If he's asked to do that too much, it might uh, might might submarine his chances. That's true. Uh, on the other side of, of that game, uh, no Joseph Wall uh, for, for the Toronto Maple Leafs is he's still battling a lower body injury. And, and Anthony Stolar has got the start for for Toronto. What's what's going on with Joseph Wall? What's your read into that situation? Well, it's concerning, right? I mean, the, he didn't, he wasn't available for game seven against Boston in May. And then as a surprise on day one of the season, he's not available for the Leafs, uh, to start the year five plus months later. Uh, obviously a lot transpired in the meantime, including him getting a three year contract extension from the Maple Leafs at, at the earliest possible opportunity. So he signed for three years beyond this one. And so obviously this is a player the Leafs believe in. I think he's given them reason to believe when he's played for me, the biggest issue is that he's had a number of injuries. He's had different injuries and he's seems to be suffering from these injuries, not at periods where he's been taxed too hard. Right. I mean, we haven't seen him really have a run as, as even a long term, like a two month, number one goaltender, let alone a six or seven month, you know, full season kind of load. And, you know, I think that's where for me, there's some concern here is that, you know, you just can't rely on him at this stage. And you know, the Leafs are in a pretty pre- precarious spot to start this season because, you know, he gets put on IR, which means he's out for the first week now, at least, uh, and potentially longer. You know, he spoke to the media also, Julian, the day before the game. It made it yes, sound he like did. he was going to play. I mean, if you look at his quotes, he's talking about how much he loves the Bell Center and he looked up to Carey Price. And I mean, look, maybe – Maybe he didn't want to give away the hand or maybe something has come up, but it's just, it's, there's a lot of mystery there. And well, I, I think the Leafs certainly feel good about Anthony Stolarz. I think they should feel good about what they saw in the first game from him. Yes. He, he lets it the, the one goal on a cross ice pass in the, the, the power play. But other than that, you know, clean sheet for Stolarz in his debut at the Leafs, but you know, he's just never played a lot of NHL games and, and they're already talking about starting him again on Thursday night. Uh, you know, they're obviously plan to use him more than he's ever been used before. I think that that would have had that even with a healthy Joseph Wall, but you know, I just just don't know how they're going to manage this early part of the schedule as they get through this and and really can Wall get healthy? I mean, I think that's it's been a huge organizational question. Again, the guy's in fantastic shape. Like it's not like 
It's not like there's concerns about his, you know, anything to do with that he's doing away from the rank or anything like that. But for whatever reason, he just, you know, he hasn't been able to, to stay healthy. I don't know if it's a bad run of luck or, or what it is. You know, the Leafs I know have invested a lot in trying to, to get some of those answers for him or in conjunction with him during the off season. But, you know, it's an, it's an auspicious start, I would say to the year. Like on one hand, yeah, it's just one week. Who cares? But, but if he's not back right away, I mean, it just, you, you start to get, you know, some of the conversation in Vancouver, right? I mean, totally different mm-hmm. circumstances, but it's the same situation where Thatcher Demko was unavailable at the end of the playoffs. You go through this off season, he's unavailable to start the season. You know, in his case, it's, you know, it's a very unusual knee related injury that he has. They don't have really a specific timetable on his return. And he's such an important part of the team. I think Joseph Wall, while nowhere nearly as established as Demko, could be that for the Leafs. The promise is all there, but, you know, you're not getting the delivery. So, um, you know, basically, it's it's hard to come out firing yet until we see how long this drags on for. But I think there's reason for some concern, you know, but the, the Leafs might have to use Stolars more than they want to. What happens if he gets injured? I mean, again, he's not ever shouldered a huge workload in the NHL. He's, he also has had some injuries in his past. Um, you know, then you're down to Dennis Hildeby and Matt Murray is your tandem. I mean, it just mm-hmm. it just feels all a little uncertain. And, and look, at that's in some ways that's goaltending. You know, we've seen a lot of good teams. I think of Carolina, like they've consistently used three goalies minimum every year, right? Kochetkov's yeah. been there. Obviously, they had Ronta and Anderson, and you know, like they, like they, this isn't totally unique to the Leafs or anything like that. But when you just don't have they, they don't have a proven number one yet is, is just the truth, right? So you have a lot of players that have had nice stretches. Uh, and then you have a bit of a wild card, Matt Murray, who has been a number one, but he's a long way removed from that. And he's coming off of a significant hip surgery last year that basically cost him the season. So, um, you know, maybe it'll work, but you can start to see some storm clouds gathering and, and, you know, maybe Joseph Wall will put this to bed. He'll be healthy to play next Wednesday when, when they play or next Saturday. But, if this if this drags on through October, I mean, this is going to be a major storyline in Toronto. Absolutely. Uh, to your point about Archer Seelofs, uh, not not the best start for the Vancouver Canucks. Just wanted to mention them briefly. Uh, you already have fans already clamoring for Kevin Lankinen to start the next game. What a wild barn burner! I think we might have had the a game of the year candidate between Vancouver and Calgary yesterday. I managed to cut, catch a little bit. I know you slept a little early, but just you mentioning Archer Seelofs made me think of of Vancouver Calgary and how that game went yesterday, and the fact that uh, yeah, Thatcher Demko can't come back soon enough for that team. Yeah, well, and, and look, it doesn't. It's going to be a few weeks at minimum. You know, like best mm-hmm. case scenario is is a couple weeks. So, you know, the the good news is Seelov's had a great run through for them in the playoffs. I mean, I don't think we could overreact to one game positively or negative for any team for any individual no. performer. I mean, I, I picked Edmonton to win everything on our last show, and then they started with a six nothing loss in in the first night of the season. So, I mean. If, if, if we were overreacting to, to anything, we'd be, I think we'd, we'd be in trouble. But, you know, Seelovs did have a nice finish last year. Lankanen has, has been a really solid number two, um, and, and including last season in Nashville. And there's a reason why they signed him uh, to have, you know, the depth that, that they might need to get through this season. But, um, yeah, you can't get back soon enough. I love the, the play where, where Quinn Hughes is defending the empty net and then amazing you know, long outlet pass to JT Miller and he rips home the tying goal. I mean, uh, I might have slept early, but I certainly caught the highlights and that was, uh, looked like a, looked like a great night there for the Canucks Flames. And, you know, that's, that's more the game. As I say, that's more the October games I'm expecting is this wild back and forth and lots of goals and everybody's getting their cookies. Not, not these one nothing games. No, uh, a sick goal from Connor's area too, uh, in the overtime I'm telling you we, an early candidate for game of the year. Uh, Siege, I didn't intend on this. This is a pretty goalie heavy show. Like we mentioned Sam Montembeau. Uh, we, we just had a conversation about Joseph Wall. We just casually mentioned Archer Seelofs. And we also have to talk about goaltenders getting paid or wanting right, to we're get crashing paid. the crease here, brother. Thank you for taking that term. Yes, that that's exactly <laughs> what I want to hear. That's what I pitched in the group chat yesterday. We got to crash the crease uh, and talk about more of these goalies around the league. Uh, we did uh, uh, work on the uh, Linus Allmark story yesterday, but I want to get to Igor Shosturkin first. Uh, was asked about his contract uh, status. He is a pending UFA at the end of the year. No comment. 
after his uh, first game of the season, uh, which saw him shut out the Pittsburgh Penguins. Where are the Rangers and Igor Shosturkin at contract-wise? Well, it's an interesting situation, right? Because Shosturkin had wanted to get this done before the season started. Obviously, and evidently did not distract him because he pitches a shutout in his uh, season opening start in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. on Wednesday. And, and, you know, where they go from here, I think is, is, is going to be very telling. You know, the Rangers have not got up to where Shesterkin wants to be. And, you know, I'd point you to a specific number on the Rangers cap sheet. It's, it's got a lot of numbers and I don't have them in front of me, but, uh, Artemi Panarin's cap hit is 11.6, blah, 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 two, three, eight, four. He's got a f- very unusual cap hit, but it's 11.6 mm-hmm. million and change. And, you know, th- there seems to be the impression out there that Shesterkin feels like he's the most viable player on the team and that he has a case to be paid as the highest paid member of the team, which I actually do think like are reasonable claims. Like, I don't, I don't think that's out to lunch ridiculous by any stretch. I think that's a fair thing for him to say. But of course, if he's to say get paid 11.7 million just to throw a number out there, that's, that's a long way above the next best goaltenders in the league. I mean, yes, there's the carry price deal that we talk about at 10 and a half, but you know, Kerry's not in the league anymore. Among active goaltenders, the highest paid goaltender is Sergei Bobrovsky at 10 million flat. So to go from 10 million to 11.7 million is, is a pretty significant jump. Um, you know, obviously we're now seeing a bunch of goalies and I'm sure we'll get to them clustered in sort of the eight to 10 million range. Uh, you know, a bunch of these new guys signing are kind of getting up to that range and that's, that's good. It's a sign of upward momentum if you're a goaltender, but mm-hmm. you know, for Shesterkin to, to, to pole vault right to the top. Um, it's, it takes a lot. And so the Rangers didn't get there. You know, what, what's interesting is, is usually I'd say a player in his shoes, and uh, this goes for skaters that are among the, like, usually the stars won eight years on a, a contract like this. I, I think that what's telling about Shesterkin is I think he'd consider that the eighth year maybe isn't the be all and end all for him. I think the AAV is what, you know, is, is got his eye. And there's lots of arguments here. I mean, if we get into percentage of salary cap, I mean, when Carey Price signed his $10.5 million deal six years ago, that was a huge, hugely different percentage of the cap than even if Shesterkin got 11.7, again, to pick her number at random, uh, today. And so that's kind of where it's at. I just don't know where it's going because, you know, well, I, I have to believe if the Rangers came back to him on November 15th with the offer that, that he's been looking for, he'd probably accept it. You know, there's no firm indication at this time if he or, or his agent are willing to negotiate in season, you know, again, I think they will be if the Rangers are, are pushing their offer up, but if not, you know, maybe the year plays out and, you know, there's risk in that for, for both sides. I think that the risk for Shesterkin just is a down swing in performance or injury or something that derails a season. And then, you know, he's, you know, I, I can't confirm the $88 million that, that Kevin Weeks reported he turned down, but it, you know, I do believe it's in that range. If it's not exactly 88, that the Rangers have been clear they were willing to go above 10 and a half. So if their last offer was 11, it would be in line with, with everything that I've been told. But, um, you know, that they, they might be in a bit of a standoff here and it's unusual, right? To have, unfortunately, we're seeing, a, for those that like free agency, we're seeing a lot of players come off the board in the last month. You know, there's been a lot mm-hmm. of what could be big name free agents signing. Um, but maybe. Maybe it'll be Shesterkin. I mean, I believe he wants to stay in New York, but it seems like he's very set on getting a specific kind of contract. And to this stage, the New York hasn't been willing to go there. Would you pay like 12, 13 million? Just thinking back to that random, uh, that example we got a couple days ago where we were asked, I think if you'd rather pay Igor Shesterkin 11 million or I think Mitch Marner 11 million. I don't remember this was the specific number, but like this dude clearly wants to blow the top number already for goaltenders out the water like that's been out there and maybe that's maybe that's 12 million maybe that's 13 million if you're the rangers is that wise to do so especially when you consider the fact he might not even need the eight years well there's two ways to look at it right i mean i think the fact if he's willing to do it on seven years it it actually makes it slightly more palatable it just reduces the risk that there could be a year later on that that you're paying him a lot of money and he's just not what he once was uh, the second part of it, though, is that on one hand, you might say, well, goalies don't make that much. And, and that's true. I mean, like, if you look at the, if you look at the goalie leaderboard for contracts, there's not, 
you know, that's way far and above. But the second argument I would make to you is there's not that many goalie. Like if you move on from them, like if you don't want to pay them that, there's mm-hmm. not that many other stud goalies out there that you can feel confident will be at the top every year uh, among the goaltending charts. And so like it is there, he, he does provide something that's a bit of a scarce resource nowadays. And um, you know, some of the other goalies that are in his class or that he's trying to get into their class. Cause you know, he's probably not, he's not, he hasn't reached Vasilevsky levels yet. Right. I mean, Vasilevsky has got the two cups and the con Smythe and, and, but you know, he's, he's in, in the conversation with the Hellebucks and the Vasilevskys as, as being among the best goalies in, in the league. I, I don't, th- I, I honestly think it's look at, I haven't done this in detail, but I, I don't think it's crazy to give him that it's, it's bucking the trend. It's, it's obviously taking away money. You don't have elsewhere. You've got players like, you know, Alexi Lafreniere, who's, who's coming up on a contract. Like, you know, there's, there's trickle down effects to every contract you give out, especially big money ones. But I also think he's a big money talent. Like, like, what do you, the, you know, if your answer is no, I'm not paying him that, then, then my next question is, well, then what are you doing? Like, are you letting him just walk away? Would you ever consider trading him? I mean, that seems kind of crazy given the expectations on the Rangers yeah. season. Off to a pretty good start. One and zero start with you know lots of good vibes around it for them. Um, you know, I I just think sometimes when you have special players, even when you, the numbers get a little uncomfortable, you just got to hold your nose and and sign the contract. But you know, he's a he's a UFA too. He's like he's got he's got a ton of leverage here, especially if he plays well this year. If he plays well, I mean. I could see him getting seven times 12 on the open market. I'll, I'll say that. Like if he, if he were to go free on July 1st, I, I think that would be out there for him. I think there'd be more than one team that would be willing to give him that. Um, and so let's see, let's see where it goes. I mean, look, in the end, they might end up splicing it in the middle and maybe he gets, maybe he gets Panarin's contract exactly or gets 11 and a half million in season. But, you know, right now it's, it's at a little bit of a standoff. And I think there's, there's certainly some emotion around it because, you know, some of the numbers are leaking out there publicly and, you know, nobody likes that. I mean, it just, it's, uh, it's not quite on Swayman levels. You don't have the team president coming out and talking about the numbers, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's a high stakes negotiation. And, um, you know, Chesterkin, I think ultimately wants to focus on the season, but this has got to be somewhere in the back of his mind. Could you imagine uh, James Dolan having to come out and say, uh, hey, I have 88 million reasons why I'd want to play goalie for the Rangers? I could imagine that. I don't think it's going to happen, but I, I mean, it's not, you know, James Dolan runs that, that, that team. And I know the Knicks and everything. I mean, he's, his word is, his word is law in that, that building. And so if he wants to say something, I'm sure no one's going to tell him, don't say that. Absolutely. Uh, let's get to lead us all, Mark. Uh, four year deal for him, 8.25 million AAV. As far as we know, complete coincidence that the AAV is the exact same as his boy Jeremy Swayman in Boston. Uh, what did you think of that deal coming down? Well, I don't think it's a co- complete coincidence. Um, and, you know, my understanding all along is the Sens, you know, we're basically waiting for Allmark to be ready to engage in contract talks. You know, they, they went through the offseason. Obviously, they liked the player. They made the trade to get him with one year left on his deal. They didn't make that trade wanting to walk him right to free agency in summer 2025. But they wanted to give him time to get comfortable in the city, get comfortable around the organization, and ultimately want to come to the negotiating table. And here we are, what? Sunday, the Swayman deal got done. So mm-hmm. 72 hours after the Swayman deal gets done, he gets the same AAV. I, th- I think it's easy enough for us to connect the dots that, you know, and, and look, I think it should be the case. I mean, <clears throat> those guys shared a lot of success in Boston. And, you know, I think you could – it's it's not it's really not an apples to apples comparison. I mean, Swayman signs as an RFA, you know, it's six UFA years. Like like I'm just saying, like if you were doing the negotiation behind the scenes, I don't I think that the you'd be looking at different comparables. But it's easy enough to just say, look, I think I'm as good as this guy, and and you know, ultimately, Olmark had a fair amount of leverage in his negotiation because. The Sens obviously didn't want to walk him into some situation where he, where he leaves. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's fitting those two good buddies and former teammates end up on the same number. I think, you know, there's a bit of risk here for Ottawa. Obviously they haven't seen him play for their team yet, but I mean, there's risk in every contract. <laughs> no, no way around that. And, and by limiting it to a four year deal, I do think that 
they do mitigate it to, to some degree. And, and, you know, it's five years now he's under contract to the team. Um, you know, what were your impressions like being at the press conference? What, yeah. what were the, what, what were the vibes like? What did you, what did you take from, from yesterday? Just in like the last few days, I'll, I'll, I'll add the last few days. Cause you're right. Linus Allmark has yet to play a meaningful game for that franchise, but just off of, what he's done in preseason and off of the impression that he's kind of left on teammates in the organization. This seems like a real breath of fresh air with this player. Basically since 2017 goaltending has been this Achilles heel for, for, for Ottawa. I know I've written that before, but like you can look at the numbers. It has not been stellar for them. And, and since Craig Anderson has left, they've been looking for that ideal number one to replace him. Eunice Corpusala last year, it did not work with him in Ottawa. So for Linus Olmark to come in and, and kind of just establish himself without playing a regular season game, yet they play their first game tonight against the Florida Panthers. I, I think that plays a huge role in 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 why the Ottawa Senators were were very much enamored with this player and and why they definitely wanted him signed. Like I I think the vibes of that press conference it seemed as if the Sens obviously are happy to make the deal that they did. Uh, players obviously seem pretty happy about it. Now that now it has to go work. I I wonder just I wondered it, when this deal would get done. I, I figured with the way that Steve Stales was talking about it, saying it's something they'll get they'll they'll look at in the near future when I had that one-on-one with him a couple of days ago, I figured, Hmm, I wonder if this is something that could get done before the season. Uh, Linus had told me, you know what? I don't want to get rushed into, into anything when it's time to make the decision. I'll make the decision. I just wondered all along, just, just thinking human nature here, going through a regular season, you don't have your contract settled. We're seeing that play out in New York right now. It can work for some people it might not work for, for other people, but I, I I understand why this deal got done when it did. Now it's just on Linus Allmark to, to to go out there and, and and show and prove why he's worth that money. What I'm wondering now, and 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 I'd love to know your opinion on this. You have the core that's there: Brady Kachuk, Josh Norris, Shane Pinto, all those guys, and then you sign Linus Allmark, who's 31, to a four year deal. This team's clearly trying to make the playoffs and make the next step. Is is that is that that has to be? I don't know if that's. I don't know if the window term is the right way to place it, but I wonder if that could still sort of be used. Like, is that some, is that some kind of pathway? Is that like some kind of window? That's the time they need to get themselves competitive. Not necessarily win a cup, but they need to be competitive in that stretch. I mean, they got to win a cup in that stretch. No. Well, I, I'm not sure, saying yeah. you can't extend beyond five years. I just but don't I mean, know if they can in that. I stretch. haven't done the deep That's dive. How long is Kachuk signed for? I mean, how long the the window is really like those those eight year deals they sign those players to? Like, when do those start coming due? Because a when the, at that time those players could leave, some of them, all of them, whatever, or they're getting big raises, which you know makes it further difficult to to keep it going. I mean, I I think the window like where they have to be trying to win a cup is like two or three years. I'm not saying they, they will get there, but like internally, that's got to be where your focus is. I mean, there's lots of teams with that window and, and only one cup to give out each June. So, I mean, it doesn't, mm-hmm. the math doesn't add up in, in the favor of any one organization, but I, I think there has to be urgency in Ottawa. I think there is urgency, frankly. I mean, you look at their off season, like they're adding all these veteran players. They're, they're trying to better surround Claude Giroux to be sort of a strong voice in the locker room to bring the younger players along. Like I understand what they're, they're trying to do there. The one thing I'll say on Allmark too, and, and I don't mean to bring up any bad memories for anyone, and he's got a really strong track record. So it's not Apple's, it's not a perfect comparison, but um, it did remind me a little bit of the Matt Murray acquisition back in the day where they traded for him when at that point Murray had really been through some injuries in Pittsburgh, but give him the big mm-hmm. deal before he plays there. And it's like, this is our number one. And obviously that didn't work. And then obviously Corpusalo gets a pretty big free agent deal. This is our number one. Now, now Allmark has the best track record coming in of those players, you know, in the moment, but it, it's, it's definitely trying to manifest something. And, you know, obviously those last, those prior two decisions didn't work very well for Ottawa. Um, you know, I think the odds of this one succeeding are better, but I mean, it, it almost, I almost hate to say it. Like there's not a lot of fallback option here. Like this, this really better work. This has to work. Because it's, it's, it's a, your point about, it's a yeah. big amount of money. You don't really have another guy in the system that's poised to be a number one if Allmark, you know, doesn't run with it this year. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, 
it's a high stakes bet. Again, I think it's not necessarily a bad bet, but it's, it's, if this doesn't work, I mean, you don't like to think of what the next steps would look like. For what, uh, to your point about Brady Kachuk, uh, his contract expires 2028, but his no movement clause kicks in, uh, next season. Something right. to think about. I mean, not that it's all tied just to Brady Kachuk, but like you're excited right. about those type of players eventually carrying you to better days. The Stutzlas, you know, I mean, and so to me, the window is as long as they're signed now where you have to be, you have to be giving them a reason to resign. And, and one of the reasons would be if, if they feel like they could win a cup there. So you have to get your organization in a position where the players themselves believe they're on the cusp of doing something or else, you know, they're, they're just less likely to stick around. I mean, that's, that's ultimately why Leon Dreisaitl stayed in Edmonton, right? Is, is the Oilers got to a point where he truly believes he can win a Stanley Cup there. Uh, obviously they paid him a ton of money and they gave him eight years, which no other team could do. But like that was, that was the tiebreaker in the end. And so, um, you know, I'd say even like with Austin Matthews doing his, his third deal in Toronto, that came at a time when he felt like the Leafs gave him a chance to win a cup. Like if that goes away in any of those markets, the top players are going to look elsewhere. Absolutely. This episode of the Chris Johnson show is brought to you by Mint Mobile. You know, when you discover a new binge worthy show or a song that you bump on repeat and you just have to share it with your friends so they can experience how awesome it is. That's kind of what it feels like when you discover that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for $15 a month when you purchase a three month plan. It's such an awesome deal. There's no way you can keep it to yourself. By the way, friends don't let friends overpay for wireless. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plan and switch to Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is here to rescue you and your squad with premium wireless plans starting at $15 a month. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your own phone number along with all of your existing contacts and ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's deal and get three months of premium wireless service for $15 a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month wireless plan for $15 a month, go to mintmobile.com slash Johnston. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to about $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Uh, one more goalie uh, story for you. Joey Decord uh, getting a 5x5. Five five. Hasn't played that many games in the NHL, though. Very interesting deal for him. Yeah, it tells us two things, right? I mean, great for Joey Decord, who, who really traveled the long road to a spot to get that kind of security in the NHL. Uh, I think is he 2012 is maybe when he was drafted. Anyway, it was, it was basically a 10 year journey from actually played for the senators very early in his career briefly. Um, but he's, you know, he's at 69 career games. So to get five times five is, is really a, a nice story for him, but it also makes you wonder about Philip Grubauer, right. In Seattle, who's already on a pretty um, pricey deal, almost 6 million for him. You know, it hasn't, he's had lots of injury, you know, things to deal with since he's been with the Kraken, you know, hasn't given them the kind of goaltending that they would expect. I mean, again, I don't want to overreact to one game, but even opening day, they're got an afternoon game there. They're up to nothing. He, you know, lets in a tough goal and, and they end up losing that to Seattle, to St. Louis rather three, two. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think it tells us about the belief they have in Joy Decord, who, if you remember, was the star of the winter classic last year when it was played in Seattle. Uh, you know, ended up kind of taking the reins for that team and, and, you know, giving them a lot of great play. But, you know, I think it just, you know, that's another team where we're, we're talking about urgency. Like they, they have to win, uh, in that market. I think there's a lot of, you know, they're not a, they're not an expansion team anymore. Do you know what I mean? And, and they, they want to, you know, they, they were big players in free agency, gave up a lot of money to Chandler Stevenson and Brandon Montour and, you know, They've graduated Shane Wright now, you know, one of their early top picks uh, as part of the roster, played a, played a good opening game. And so, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, that the patience will wear thin, I guess, with Grubauer if, if things don't, don't, don't turn around there. So on one hand, they're, they've now solidified. There's no question about the cord, uh, you know, going forward for them and, and just be curious to watch how, how things materialize between him and his partner. Like even think how unusual that is on the second day of the season, he signs an extension. He didn't start a pretty good extension, but you know, and he didn't start game one of the season. So, um, you know, there's a lot of tandems around the league. That's, that's a true tandem. And now the getting paid similar to his tandem made in 
I'm sure they're just going to run with whichever player plays best this year. Uh, very quickly, Joy Decor drafted in 2015, seventh round pick, 199th 15. overall. The, the and best he played in Arizona, right? Like before Arizona had a D1 program, I think. Man. Shout out Joy Decor. Getting paid. Arizona State. Yeah, spent three years with uh, with ASU. Um, it just reminded me a bit because we ahead. didn't touch on it, but Carter Verhage gets his big deal in Florida. Yes, he 56 did. $56 million, eight year contract. But Carter Verhage was, you know, Briefly a Maple Leaf, traded to the Islanders, cut it by the AHL Bridgeport a couple times, was in the ECHL for them, ends up making his way up onto a Tampa team that had all kinds of cap trouble, so there was an opportunity for him. Gets let go by the Lightning, lands in Florida, obviously he's scored a ton of goals and become an impact player for the Panthers. But, you know, a guy who really was – he was in the ECHL at one point. Like, if you would have went to Carter Verhage and said, hey, don't worry, bud, you're going to win a couple Stanley Cups – and you're going to sign a $56 million ticket in a tax-free state with all kinds of signing bonuses. Just just keep at it. I mean, he probably wouldn't have believed you. I, I imagine there was probably some days in Joey Decord's life if, if you had said, don't worry, you're going to get a $25 million deal here. Um, just just keep at it. So I, I kind of like to highlight those stories of perseverance because at the same time we're saying this, there are players out there right now in no man's land, not sure about where their careers are going and you know, some of them are going to beat the odds and, and make it to the big show and and uh, get all the get all the good things that come with that. I love that. That's a that's a great way of putting it. Siege, believe in yourself. Uh, are you ready to answer questions? We did not get to ask CJ earlier this week, uh, so we're going to go through some questions today. How about that? Yeah, and thanks for everyone for sticking with us. Julian's got a big move. He's been a busy time in Ottawa, so we did a Tuesday show. Everything's this is like this is like upside down week, but we'll, we'll get back to regular schedule programming here soon. Yes. Uh, the first question actually is from Red Shark Pack. Uh, how was the move? Uh, it's it's still on your I got a bunch of bins. I still got to go through with all my stuff and still got to get some furnishings together. But uh, I'm here. I'm in Ottawa. I got my apartment. We're on the same time zone. Uh, it's it's happening. I'm do you have a car? Did you here. have a car in Calgary? Like, how do you deal with a car when you move? I had a so basically, I went to some shipping company and got them to. It was it's actually funny. I got them to ship it from Calgary to Montreal because it was cheaper for me to send it to Montreal, where the company has a terminal, versus Ottawa, where they don't. So this weekend, I'm gonna go back home to Montreal, um, and I think around that time, my car should be back, and I'll drive it back to Ottawa when I get it. Like, that's good because I was I, I love yeah, Ottawa, yeah. but it's a city you absolutely need a car in. Like there's just it's not a, especially if you're going out to Canada, which I'm sure you will be a bunch to to do the arenas. I mean, there's there's no way around it. You got to drive in Ottawa. Oh yeah, hat tip to uh, Alex Adams uh, from Sportsnet, who's literally been driving me all week. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna give him five stars on the Uber driver there or what? <laughs> I might have to. Dude picks me up in a in a in a nice ass Tesla. Like I I, I might have to, man. Like this, this is a wow. nice whip. You could, I'll, ta- he, he, I'll tell you this. Nice. When I've traveled, I I mostly try to avoid renting cars. Like I, I just don't like yeah. dealing with it, getting, you know, finding a gas station when you're going back to the airport, blah, 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 blah. But Ottawa, of course, is the exception. You, you always have to rent a car there. I remember once I, I flew in and I got this giant pickup truck. Like I'm talking like oh my God. a big ass pickup truck. Which is fine, but like I've, I've never like really driven a car that big, frankly. And then I yeah. had to go for some reason downtown into the market, uh, from, from the airport. And like, I just remember driving around the market. Like it's so narrow, the streets that I'm in. It's just like ridiculously oversized pickup truck. And uh, oh thankfully God. I didn't hit anything, but I just remember that was like one of the most <laughs> perilous driving experiences of my life. Um, Ooh. I don't know why I'm told that story, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that story. It's a good story. Someone actually asked, uh, MLG Philly, what is the hardest arena in the NHL to get to based on its location and flight availability? Is Ottawa Ooh. near the top of the list, considering the fact that it's so far west from the city? It probably is. The thing is, I live in Toronto, so the flight thing is easy. Like, there's a flight every hour from Ottawa to Toronto. In fact, Ottawa's so great. Like if you're flying between Ottawa and Toronto, as long as you don't check a bag, you can basically, it's like getting on a bus. Like you can show up like a bit early and they'll put you on the earlier flight, usually mm-hmm. with no problems. So it's, it's, it's pretty convenient that way. Um, I'm trying to think of hard places to get to. Like 
Columbus is a, is a hard flight city, but then the arena is downtown and there's tons of hotels and you just walk. So like that's, that part is easy. Yeah. Um, well, where else? I, I mean, Glendale like used to matrix when, when, when the coyotes were in Glendale, like that, that was a long way from the Phoenix airport, like a long way. Ooh. Raleigh is a little inconvenient. Um, because you, you kind of need a car there or lots of Ubers. And sometimes the Uber situation isn't great. Like, like the highways, the, sorry, the arena is just off like this big highway. There's not like a hotel next to it. So there's always like logistics involved with covering hurricanes games. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm probably going, I've probably taken this question to heart more than the person meant, but no, I, I, I think you're, I think, I think they would appreciate this. Cause I'm trying, I mean, I haven't been to San every rink, Jose, so I feel like, you go San Jose is kind of a hard place to fly to from far away. Um, mm-hmm. like, and I live far away. So like, I know if you live in like Denver, like there's direct flights right into the San Jose airport, which is very close to the arena, but you know, usually got to fly to San Fran. There can be killer traffic that can be like $150 Uber, um, oh. which, you know, depending on your company, like it, it could just be like getting to San Jose isn't always the most convenient. I remember that San Jose Pittsburgh Stanley Cup final was like, that was a journey. Is San Jose I love travel logistics. This? this is the person is like really like I love, I love planning trips. I love figuring out the best, you know, most logical way to do this stuff. So anyway, that's why I'm wondering if we need like some kind of like matrix or some kind of like big map where maybe I should have given you this question in advance and given you like eight hours to like go through <laughs> every possible NHL city and and measure out like well it takes this much time to take an Uber but with this flight it takes all this time blah 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 kind of like that Charlie Day meme. Well, the person threw in two variables, right? They they flew they threw in like hard arena to get to, but then they also threw like the travel variable because. You yeah. know, some places are much easier to fly to than others. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, my brain's everywhere. I, I I think San Jose, for the purposes of this question, that's going to be the answer. Unless there is a more difficult spot than San Jose. No, I mean, a lot of the rinks are in downtown metropolitan places, right? And then usually when they are, there's hotels nearby and restaurants and everything you would need to go there for a day and a half and do your job. So like most of them are automatically off the list. Like there's not even a thought. It's just, it's more about, you know, like Florida's rink is kind of in this weird no man's land. Although even there are it hotels is. and a big mall near it. So yeah, yeah. Like at least you have that, but it's like, like if I wanted to go to the elbow room, like that's a whole journey. Like it's nowhere near the, yeah. the, uh, the, the arena. That's one of the many reasons why you won't find me there too often. <laughs> Uh, unless uh, the Panthers go back to the Stanley Cup final, I guess. Um, next one from uh, no, I Eric. was not. I didn't go, man. I was. In, I spent all those days in Florida and didn't. I wasn't there. You were not there. You just didn't. You just, <laughs> you just didn't go. No, because I didn't go all the way into Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Anyway, yes. Anyway, yes. Um, th- this next one from Eric. I I really can't wait to hear the answer to this one. There's a few of these I can't wait to hear the answer to. Uh, why does CJ Uh-oh. not show? Now, why does CJ not show as much emotion about the Leafs' failures compared to the Blue Jays' failures? I mean, pretty easy. I don't have the allegiance to them. So, you know, I'm not spending money on the Leafs. I'm not, I, I spend my time on the Leafs at times, but I'm getting compensated by my employer to do so. So mm-hmm. I'm just not a, I'm not a fan of the team. It's, it's that simple. Um, you know, that it's, it's such a common question that journalists get. Like, it's so, I can't even explain to you how easy it is to separate the two, especially when you get to my age. And I've been literally doing this half my life. Like you just, it's just not, it's not nearly the same thing. The Blue Jays are what I do in my spare time. The Blue Jays are what I do in my summers when I'm off, you know, when I'm around the Leafs, I'm there always thinking about stories and talking to players and, like it's even when you watch a game, you just watch a game differently from a press box when you're going to have to write than a game you would if you had a beer and you're sitting in the, you know, in the first row of the 300 level or something like it. Or if I'm at a Jays game, I'm, you know, I'm not thinking about, hey, what would I write tonight if I was covering this? Like I've just, you know, one is work and the other is pleasure. I think it's the simplest way to put it. So um, I don't have nearly the same emotion or really any emotion tied up in it. Yeah, like I, I find people, I find more and more now, like people don't get the fact that 
in our jobs covering teams, like, like I'd much rather not be a fan of, of any team that I'm covering. Like, and, and people just don't have that. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know if you, you've encountered it like so many times, but like, I get the sense that like people just don't get that, you know, if you're working in the NHL and you're working as a reporter, like you're not a fan of the team that you cover. Like I've had so many people say like, Oh, so are you going to be like a fan of the Sens? Or when I was going in Calgary, they were like, Oh, so are you like a flames fan now? It's like, no, like I'm still just being objective doing my job. Like I just find it really interesting that people don't get that. You can cheer for people. You can like people that you deal with. You can be happy when they have big moments. Like, you know, it's not like you're cheering rah, rah or wearing their Jersey. I don't mean like that, but like you can be happy. I can feel happiness when I'm around, you know, someone who does something that that's, you know, when you watch the Panthers win the Stanley Cup, I can feel happiness for the people that I've known on that team and know like, like that's, it's not the same as cheering for them like a fan. Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's like hard for me to understand how other people don't understand it, but of course they've never done in my job. And, and that's fair. You know, like, like my sister works in a bank. I don't actually know what she does at her job. Like people might know we're sports reporters, but they might not really know what that means. Like they know we go to the games, but they might not understand the exact interactions we're having. So, you know, I'm to be honest, and I, and I know Steve isn't a journalist. I'm more amazed that Steve can still care about the Leafs as much as he evidently does. Like I'm more amazed that he doesn't burn out because, you know, he's a media personality for sure. He, he does, you know, produces a ton of content. He's done it for 15 years or whatever it is with his LFRs. Like I'm more amazed that he could maintain his fandom, let alone the question going the other way. I mean, to me, it's the easiest thing in the world. Like I watch any two teams play and my cold, dark heart does not get excited when one scores a goal or, or lets one. It like, I I'm excited to see the players do amazing things. And like, I'm curious, like I'm always curious about what it means for storylines and whatever, but um, just, it's pretty easy not to care who wins and loses in any given night. Uh, this next one from D Fizzle. After that Jays rant, I got to know, have you guys had any I'd like to speak to your manager moments? Just those situations where someone really needs to be corrected by their bosses. They're basically asking if you've ever had a Karen moment. No, I worked at Wendy's in high school and I saw all kinds of shit, frankly, and like people treat you like crap. And, you know, I was there. Honestly, when I first started I was making $6 and 40 cents an hour working at Wendy's after my, you know, I'd go to school all day and then go to work and basically have to clean up junk in the garbage and make burgers and whatever. And, and like take a lot of stuff from people. So like, I've never, I've always had a lot of empathy for people who work in the service industry, which is largely what you're talking about front facing jobs that aren't necessarily glamorous. And, and so I've honestly, I've never, I've never taken out my frustrations on the person or people in front of me that includes like airline employees when they, things go wrong or anything. Like I just, I, I, it's not, not my mojo, but I will certainly, I got a lot of texts. I'll say after that Jay's rant, I got a lot of people were like, <laughs> Hey, you were spot on. And like some people yeah. I didn't expect or didn't know that listened to our pod. So, I mean, I got no problem taking it out on those people cause they're paid millions to guide the organization. And they're just willingly ignoring the fact that the team is sliding in the wrong direction for three straight years and just trying to be like, well, it'll be fine next year. So <laughs> I, I don't mind having a Karen moment on them on a podcast, but if you're, um, you know, if you're doing something that makes my day better, working at the grocery store, or working for the airline, I'm not, not ever going to, you're not going to feel my wrath. Uh, one thing to keep in mind in any of those situations, nine times out of 10, the person you're dealing with, like some kind of customer service rep, nine times out of 10, they've had nothing to do with whatever issue you're going through. That's something I just keep in my head every time. Yeah, we all got a boss, man. We all got a boss. You are absolutely right on that. Um, this one from Tim Wiley, I can I can handle. Uh, journalistically, what goes into moving from one beat to another? Do you get to say goodbye to previous beat colleagues and friends met in that city? How long do you get before you need to be in the new city? Do you give story ideas, tips to the new person covering your old beat? Um, I guess it really depends situation to situation. I did get to say goodbye to basically as many friends as I could back in Calgary. There were a few I didn't get to, uh, but a lot of my journalism friends I got to say goodbye to uh, I, I even went to a couple of Flames players and let them know, and I got to say goodbye to them. Uh, in terms of how long uh, you need to be before you need to be in your new city to start, I wanted to get here as soon as possible, basically. So I, 
we're, we're making it work and I'm going to be able to cover that first regular season game for the Sens in my case. But there have been people who have taken more time than that in their, in their other jobs. And uh, do you give story ideas, tips to the new person covering your old beat? Well, I guess this situation is a bit unique, right? Because the person who used to have my job works for the team now. So Yeah, Ian Mendez. I, yeah, so it was a very interesting dynamic on that one. But uh, I mean, we we talk basically every day. But at least in in our in our shop, like considering the people who have been around the team, like there's definitely different story ideas and 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 other things to think on that they I get passed on and and I have to consider for my job. So it really depends per person. But I at least try to give you the full skill, at least in my situation. Hopefully that answers the question. Honestly, it's a strength that you don't know the sends up and down. Like it's actually a benefit to you because your curiosity will find you the story. Sometimes when you think you know everything and that this isn't directed at you, just anybody, you, you miss obvious, you, you miss things because you, you think you're on top of everything. But in your case, you probably don't know the prospect pipeline. You're not familiar with the drafting history deeply. Like you're, it's going to make you have to learn things. And as you ask those questions of yourself and you discover things, you're going to, you're going to write stories that, that tell us something. So I, I've always actually thought it's better not to be an expert, quote unquote, uh, because if you follow your intuition and you learn, then you start telling everyone what you're learning and that becomes interesting coverage. Again, another gem from Chris Johnston. He's so good at this. Um, <laughs> I'll get to a few more uh, before we get to stick taps because we will still do stick taps. Uh, Sam in uh, Montreal, who is the best player you've ever seen in person? Probably Crosby. I mean, maybe McDavid. I got like tough to say. Probably Crosby at this point. But like, how do you how do you define best, right? And and I know that, that I don't. I can't ask a question back. Um, McDavid's probably done the most individually spectacular things. I guess is maybe the best way to put it. Crosby's been like just the cream of the crop for so long. You know, I came along too late to see Gretzky and Lemieux. At least in like you know, as a kid, I saw them on TV, but I wasn't at the games or I wasn't interacting with them that way. So that's probably my answer. Uh, Crosby. I've only seen a handful of times, but he's amazing. Um, McDavid would be up there for me. Nathan McKinnon. Nathan McKinnon needs to be in that conversation for me. I enjoy watching him play every time I get to see him in person. It's like watching a freight train run rampant on a nice surface. That's that's as best as I can describe watching Nathan McKinnon. I really enjoy watching him play. So Kucherov's some pretty combination. Sick too. Of, yes, he is. Nikita Kucherov is really. Sick and I've too. covered a lot I, of camp I've, over the years, and he's just like a yes, magician. You have. Man, um, yeah, I, I think Crosby, McKinnon, yeah, Kucherov definitely makes some sense there in that top five. Austin Matthews is really sick to watch live. I, I, yeah. I gotta give him that prop too. I was at his four goal um, debut. Yeah. That was something I'll never oh, yeah. forget. Man, I saw him score a hat trick uh, against the Flames last year, and seeing fans throw hats on the ice—that's that's one of the cooler things I've seen in my short time covering the NHL. What did he like, have? Like six hat tricks last year, I think. Seven, six. Shit, was it six? Damn. Yeah, he started with back-to-back ones to start the season, so he's already off pace by not scoring in the opener. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I'm being uh, facetious. Obviously, he's being facetious. Don't get mad at CJ, please. Um. I th- I just have one quick one here uh, from Sumar Sekon. Should we abolish the NHL entry draft? If players at 18 can just sign with whoever they, they want, uh, doesn't it put pressure on teams to be better culturally rather than bottom out and hope to get lucky? There's a case for it, but it, it, it's just such a change to the system. I don't see it happening. Like I could see where you're coming at. The other, the, I'll also say this though. Look, there's right now two players from the 2024 draft made NHL rosters. Uh, Jet Luchenko, who was picked 13th by the Flyers and obviously Macklin Celebrini in San Jose. So most, it's hard to say the team should be signing 18 year olds because most, like maybe most 18 year olds wouldn't then get signed. I, I don't know how that would all work. Um, it's a good point. But, I do recognize this is a, it's a tough system. You get drafted by a team. You're basically stuck with them for your first seven professional years. I mean, obviously there's exceptions, but that's kind of how it works. But, you know, that, I mean, it, it would be such a big change. I just, I can't say that it should happen. That's kind of okay. where I land. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, do you have a stick tap uh, for this week? 
I do. It's it's going to be a double stick tap, and it's for Ooh. Clayton Keller and Lawson Kraus, who both played more than 500 games for the Arizona Coyotes and got to experience their first game together in the regular season in Utah on Wednesday or Tuesday, rather. And uh, I just thought, what a cool night for for those that have given so much to, you know, all the frustrations that they dealt with in Arizona, all the uncertainty to get a night like that in Utah, where it was looked like an absolute party. Uh, obviously, the fact that the the HC, the mighty HC, started the their their new incarnation with a win over Chicago helped things. But you know, I just think to to see. The Coyotes organization, you know, I was at their last ever game at Mullet Arena. Like they, they went through so much where they had, they had to make do with so little. And I, I feel like in one thing that's happening in Utah is they're getting like the proper infrastructure built around them. I know the arena, the Delta Center needs a lot of work. They're in a temporary mm-hmm. practice facility this year at the Olympic Oval. That'll be a full time new one that's being built now. But I, ju- I just think that, that it must be pretty cool for those players to get to experience a little bit more like a top flight NHL experience and uh, to play a game like they did on Tuesday must have almost been a pinch me type moment. So stick Absolutely. taps to those guys for grinding through a lot of years to, to now look, there's expectations that, you know, I think Utah could be a playoff team. And so there, this is a, this is a different year. Unlike any of those guys have experienced. All right. I like that stick tap. Um, usually, uh, with with stick taps, obviously we're we're, we're trying. Usually, to I make it up on the fly, something. and now you're doing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that's kind of what's happening here. I'll just shout out all the uh, fans who uh, turned up to uh, the live SDP recording yesterday at Greta Bar in Toronto, uh, and also Steve, who has a book coming out, uh, and they were you signing books. Like this is man, shout out Steve for somehow being able to to be able to write books. Like that's so hard to do. Um, but yeah, uh, shout out to all the fans who tuned up, uh, who turned up at Greta Bar yesterday and uh, watched the guys uh, do their podcast. So that's that's my stick tap for this week. I'll take it. Good job, buddy. <laughs> Enjoy the home best. opener I tonight. Oh, I will. I I, I definitely will. I'll. Uh, I'm taking in this experience and enjoying every single moment of it. It's it's been amazing. I, I you know what? Uh, stick tap to uh, everyone in Ottawa who's been very welcoming uh, to me. Uh, since this move's been going down as well. I need to report uh, back we'll on back- the candy situation in the press box in Ottawa because I remember it used to be pretty decent. Ooh. You know but what's that's funny? Actually, it's been a few years the- since I covered a game there, so I don't I don't know if that's changed under the Mendez regime with PR or what. But Earlier this week, we were waiting on a media avail, and to pass the time, Ian Mendez showed up and handed out candy to everyone. All so right. I, I'd like to think... That's a precursor to more candy in the press box, but uh, I'll report back with my findings in the group chat. If I'm not mistaken, they used to have first intermission hot dogs too. Ooh. So this is this is the important info I need you to go go and report back on. I need to know what the situation's like in the press box. I mean, they're probably not going to be the same standard as the Bell Center hot dogs, which uh, I will Definitely get not. to enjoy over the weekend. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll report back on those findings uh, in the group chat. In the meantime. Uh, thank you to everyone who was listening. Thank you to everyone who was watching. And uh, drop us some questions for uh, next Ask CJ on Monday. Uh, we'll be back with more great content. Peace, guys. The Chris Johnston Show. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian at JKA McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.